the narrowest of margins, House Democrats pushed through their health care reform package at the end of a long day of debate. In the end, what this day represents is another stone firmly laid in the foundation of the American dream. Tonight, we answered the call of history as so many generations of Americans have before us. When faced with crisis, we did not shrink from our challenge. We overcame it. We were talking about how historic this was and really just how much, much emotion this, has, this one issue has stirred in this country. Who will pay for the fraud, waste, and corruption called Obamacare? This bill is the greatest threat to freedom that I have seen in the 19 years I've been here in Washington. Teddy, uh, I, I have been thinking about what you said about, uh, you know, people should be able to pay for what they can afford when it comes to health care. I kind of have a tough time thinking, agreeing with that because I don't think health care is a house or a car, or a boat. You know, you're talking about people's lives, and we should all have access to care, all well, right? Hold on now, but what, wait a minute, my friend, who's supposed to pay for it, though? It's not our job to protect people from outcomes. It's not our job to determine whether this is right or wrong or any of that. Do you have any idea what this is going to cost you? You haven't any idea. All you think is that it's a good thing because Obama wanted it. Well, let me tell you something else. Your life is over as you know it. America is over as you know it. Love Obamacare or hate Obamacare, it does mean that more people in our country have health insurance now. The verdict is in. There is an exception, though. It is the state of Mississippi. The health care system right now is a very scary, scary situation. Uh, we're potentially at a point in Mississippi where if Mississippi don't make the right decision, that we could possibly see our health care system uh, crumble down uh, around us. My name is Tamika. I'm 31 years old. Now I'm just getting back into the workforce where I can work with my passion, and that's cooking, being in the kitchen. And I, now I'm currently employed at the Cilantro's Mexican Grill on the Kenton Square. I'm a mother of four. I have three boys and one girl. I'm a licensed minister at Turning Point Fellowship Ministries International, located here in Canton. Now I'm, I'm working, my job doesn't provide insurance. I remember going to go get um, registered for school. And you know how girls just kind of like to touch their face or whatever, and I was touching my face, touching my neck, and felt this big old lump in my neck. And I was like, Mom, you know, what is, what is this? I didn't know what it was. I was told after my surgery that they not only removed the gorder, but they found cancer. My thyroid was laced with cancer. That was, that's, that was the beginning of my journey um, with thyroid issues. I now have uh, hypothyroidism, where it makes me sluggish and sleepy if I'm not on my meds and my meds are unregulated. I've been going through a struggle right now. When I've been off my meds for a long period of time. There came a point in time where I decided, well, I'm not just gonna sit up and let the government take care of me. I'm gonna go to work. And sometimes I say, why did I do that? Because I was no longer able to get Medicaid. I was excited when I got information from Tamika. Uh, I had really started pushing at that point to capture as many uninsured people as we possibly could. And she tried her best to um, get me on insurance with um, the Obamacare. I was so excited because I, we were talking and she um, told me she was working. And I was like, great, okay, what's your income? And my jaw kind of dropped. And I was like, 
own. You know, my income just wasn't enough. Uh, she tried all kinds of loopholes, avenues, asking people, well, what, what can she do? She looked at me like, what are you talking about? And that's when I had to explain to her how things work here in our state. Uh, right now we have roughly about 140,000 Mississippians now who could possibly be put on Medicaid through the Medicaid expansion that right now they have no form of health insurance at all. The Affordable Care Act hoped to cover more poor Americans by requiring states to expand Medicaid, but 26 states declined to go to that expense, creating a coverage gap. As an organization that has done um, direct enrollment, we've seen numerous cases of people coming in only to find out at that moment that the reason that they are not eligible for any health care is because our state didn't expand Medicaid. In each one of these cases, these have been people that go to work every day and they just happen to fall in the unfortunate lot of not being able to afford health care. The coverage gap, simply put, is Mississippians who make too much to qualify for our current Medicaid program but not enough to afford to get subsidies to help pay for insurance on the federal health insurance marketplace. The way the Affordable Care Act was written, states would have been required to cover people that fall into this gap. However, in 2012, portions of the ACA were challenged before the Supreme Court. And while it was ultimately upheld, the Supreme Court ruled that mandating states to expand Medicaid was unconstitutional. This made Medicaid expansion optional. And currently, 32 other states and DC have agreed to expand the program but to date, Mississippi has chosen not to expand. Currently, Mississippi's Medicaid program only covers pregnant women, the disabled, the elderly, children, and single parents that make less than $500 a month. However, in order to receive subsidies to help pay for insurance through the federal health insurance marketplace, a person needs to make at least $980 a month. This coverage gap affects tens of thousands of working Mississippians, like construction workers, home health aides, cashiers, and childcare workers. Because Medicaid is such a significant economic driver in Mississippi, the state foregoes a lot when they don't expand Medicaid. For every $1 Mississippi spends on Medicaid services, we receive three back from the federal government. By not expanding Medicaid, Mississippi leaves approximately 14 billion in economic activity on the table. That's coverage for almost 200,000 Mississippians, 20,000 new jobs, and 848 million in new tax revenues. Magnolia, Mississippi is a small city, uh, according to Mississippi standards, a city of approximately 2,700 residents. Our population has a high poverty uh, index, uh, most, uh, maybe 50% or more of the citizen lives uh, 150 percent above the national poverty index. I am Edgar Lewis and uh, I am the senior pastor of New Zion Baptist Church. Magnolia is a laid-back town, a very friendly town. Uh, used to be booming. Uh, we was getting people from Tylertown, Liberty, Brookhaven, and they all came to Magnolia because we had a theater, we had grocery stores, drug stores, and all those things here, and a hospital. Beecher Memorial Hospital was one of the largest employers in the city. When I came in as mayor, Beecham employed approximately 100 employees. 
uh, due to the um, significant cuts in revenue, they had to lay off 50 employees. When you lose 50 employees in a city the size of Magnolia with 2,700 residents, it has a very uh, negative impact on your economy. Those are employees that did business right here in the city of Magnolia. They took their lunch break and they spent money here in the city. When I took the helm, the hospital, which is the physical property, was partly owned by the city of Magnolia and the county. They approached the city and the county um, to ask for funds to uh, make it through a few months of payroll and paying bills. Well, when you budget to run a city, you budget for just that, to run a city. And unfortunately, we did not have funds available. I can remember, I know just before 2012, when they started talking about the photovac care coming and they were not gonna accept it and they were not, they gonna continue to operate. And, and they thought they were gonna be able to and still, you know, do business as usual. I'm sure the lack of um, Medicaid expansion uh, being an option in Mississippi uh, contributed to that. Uh, as a matter of fact, my discussions with hospital administrators confirmed that that was one of the problems. And that's when I really became perturbed because what it was doing to our people, you know, uh, our community here in Magnolia, and like, cause we were, our people were loyal to Beecham because that was, that's all they ever knew. And Beecham is just, just like one of the nursing homes, you know, I would think that's all it is. And that's what it's gonna be until somebody, the, the government or somebody put some money in there to make it better. You know. We're gonna see hospitals all across the state begin to have to reduce services, lay off employees, and many instances hospitals will have to close. So, so regardless of whether you own health care, you, you qualify for Medicaid or you benefit from Medicaid, uh, the lack of expanding Medicaid will, will hit you right in your backyard. It, it will come knocking on your door. There are so many people confused in this changing health care environment about who's accountable. We had to constantly do our best to educate people as to why the hospital was experiencing financial hardship. And I even had some folks who wanted to blame Obamacare. And I had to quickly remind them that in Mississippi, Obamacare does not exist because Obamacare encompasses you having Medicare expansion. Beecham in the state right now, do you think it effectively serves the needs of this community? I don't think it. I think it's just business as usual. Our hospital did a couple of things. One, it, it went to a uh, different form called critical access. 
and that is a type of hospital arrangement that allows for um, uh, hospitals to continue to survive. Uh, the problem with that, though, is that we did lose some things, and one of the things we lost was our ICU. So we lost uh, some of our uh, muscle, uh, some of the ability for us to take care of the types of patients that we were used to taking care of as a result of having to go to critical access. When I read that article uh, where the governor had talked about community health centers being the, the answer for you know, access to care, in one small component, I, I absolutely agree with him. But health care centers, um, excuse me, community health care centers, we're not the only answer. We serve the primary health care needs. We, we don't perform home health. We don't have hospice. We don't do inpatient care. We don't do long-term uh, behavioral health by and large. You may see some pockets of that throughout the state, but they're not enough to meet the need, nor are they on a large scale sustainable. We continue to see a uh, large number of uh, folks who come in for episodic care because they yet do not have access to insurance coverage, which would provide them that access that they could afford. God forbid I get sick, you know. I wouldn't be able to go to work and I wouldn't be able to go to the doctor without having an enormous medical bill from the hospital. Whenever I have a doctor's appointment to come up, um, just put back at least enough to get in the door to see the doctor. And if I have to hold on to prescriptions, you know, for weeks at a time when I need them right then until I can get money to pay for them, and that's what I have to do. If they had the health, uh, health insurance that they need, then they would not have to worry about, you know, um, um, paying the rent versus coming in and getting their high blood pressure checked and getting their high blood pressure prescription to keep that controlled so they can continue to have, you know, a, a job and a meaningful career. What, what you're talking about is an opportunity to dramatically change, you know, uh, people's access to care. It is the terminal consequences of a disease that is so expensive and it is swamping the state of Mississippi. Frankly, I've been very disappointed in, in my uh, world, the world that I dwell in, and that the healthcare community has not been more outspoken on this. And, and the fact of the matter is, I think that they were trying to be respectful of our state health leadership, which I think has been very wrong-headed about this. And I think history will describe this as a major misstep. Have you heard from, the, from hospitals or heard the hospital association wants to see an expansion because they're going to lose money under this new formula? You know, I've talked to some of them and what they're concerned about is what's called the dish payment, the disproportionate share. If that's restored, which I think it will be, I, I believe the hospitals will be fine. I don't think the federal government is going to do away with the dish payment. We are currently experiencing troubling issues around our rural hospitals. There's a program called the DISH program, and this stands for Disproportionate Share Hospitals. These hospitals are those that receive federal payments because they service a really high population of medical and uninsured people. In the Affordable Care Act, the way the law was written was because Medicaid was going to be mandatory for the states, the federal government was going to decrease those payments because you would have more people covered under Medicaid. So when you have more people covered, there would be no need for as many federal dollars going to these hospitals. Over the course of a few years, the idea was that the payments would be phased out. So when you have non-expansion states like Mississippi, you still have the problem of the dish payments also being phased out and the number of uninsured people still coming to these facilities. So you're losing money from the dish payments 
and you're still losing money from providing care for the uninsured Mississippians. So as a result, you have hospitals trying to adapt this new reality to healthcare where these dish payments are being phased out and they are still seeing uninsured patients all while having to figure out how to make the bottom line. And in some cases, this may mean hospitals having to change services, eliminate services, or in some extreme cases, even having to close. Why do you remain so convinced, sir, that Obamacare, that the health care law is going to do more harm than good in your state of Mississippi? Well, you see recently what's happened just this week. The Obamacare administration has basically said they're going to delay Obamacare. But he's asking us in Mississippi to say, uh, we believe that you're going to provide billions of dollars, roughly $11 billion between now and 2020, to the state of Mississippi, so it won't cost us anything. It's that free money from Washington. We just don't feel comfortable with that. You know, the state of Mississippi has turned, uh, turned down about a billion dollars a year to expand Medicaid in the state. Um, the governor and the legislature believes it would increase the cost of the state of Mississippi. I do not manage Medicaid. That's an issue that uh, falls under the purview of the governor and uh, the legislature, is, and they're the ones that have to choose if they want to expand Medicaid. So it's a very controversial issue. It becomes one of ideology. It's not one about uh, whether someone actually needs help. It's one about whether we think they ought to get help or not. I say we, I should say, whether the governor and the legislature think that. The first three years of the Medicaid expansion is not going to cost or wouldn't have cost the state one dime. When you look at Mississippi, Mississippi is the poorest state, we're the unhealthiest state, we have the highest rate of mortality. We have the highest rate of death as it relates to breast cancer, even though we have the lowest occurrence of it, which basically shows me or tells me that there's a lack of health care here in the state of Mississippi. A lot of the discussion uh, to this point has been about who you supported for president in the last election. I think we need to get past that and we need to look at what's best for Mississippi and what's best for the people of Mississippi. We need to look at the fact that we all have constituents who don't have health insurance as a result of the failure to expand Medicaid. And uh, that's not a Democrat or Republican issue. When, when this first issue first came forward after the Supreme Court's ruling, the only thing we was asking for is that we was asking the Speaker of the House for a vote on Medicaid expansion. Uh, we had one chairman, the chairman of Medicaid, sat on the, Medi on the Medicaid expansion bill, would not bring it up in committee, would not bring it to the floor of the House. And when you have a policy that could potentially put over 140,000 people uh, on Medicaid. Uh, that over a billion dollar a year economic impact on the state of Mississippi. I don't think three or four people in the Mississippi legislature should sit back and make that decision. That should be a decision that the entire 100, 122 members of the legislature should have an opportunity to vote on. We've got to get past the national partisan politics and look at what's in the best interest of all of the citizens of Mississippi. Unfortunately, the political spite from D.C. has come to Mississippi, and uh, some of our most vulnerable citizens are going to be forced to uh, suffer as a consequence of, of, of politics. legislators don't work fast and it's not so much a matter in my opinion of whether or not I think we have no choice but to expand Medicaid. I think urgency is is key. There's an answer there. There's an answer that's available and it's up to the legislature to do something about it. We keep repeating ourselves over and over. We need a major quantum shift in the way we look at health care in this state. It's not an issue that we should play politics with. And once you take that away, what other argument out there other than you don't want uh, some of our most vulnerable citizens in this state uh, to, to receive the same basic health care that you receive as the legislature? 
It's not an issue where we should be kicking the can down the road. Legislators who have been opposed to expansion to this point are, are going to start hearing from people who don't have health insurance, who, who learn that they could have health insurance, and they're going to ask, why? And uh, it's going to be incumbent on members of the legislature to answer that question and come up with hopefully something that will provide it for all the citizens of the state. Like I said, but God, he, he sustained me. He always, I, I get into situations and he always pulls me right out, you know, before things get too bad. And I thank God for having a strong enough faith in him. The topic today is use your voice, lead by example. Have you ever heard the phrase, you are the leaders of tomorrow. Anybody ever heard that phrase? You, you are the leaders of tomorrow. I am one of the leaders of tomorrow. My favorite scripture is Romans 8:28, and it says, All things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. And if some change is made, I feel like that I've done exactly what God wants me to do here. Can we afford to wait to make a difference in the lives of others?